420 somewhere, and right now that somewhere is right here. So hello and welcome to the Cannabis Show. My name, Producer Vince, with a nice nap, and here's your host, Ricardo Baca. His name is Producer Vince. My name is Ricardo Baca. To everybody joining us today, welcome to the Cannabis Show, where we talk about all things weed. Hashtag all things weed. <laughs> That is the serious marijuana news and the fun stuff as well. Uh, in fact, if you pop onto The Cannabis right now, you can read stories about the election. Yes, still so many stories about the most important cannabis election year we've ever known. And we have a cool Cannabis Presents coming up about it. <laughs> about moms working in Washington, D.C. and how they've, uh, they work in the cannabis industry and how they formed a support group to help one another. These seem to be popping up all over the country in 420 friendly places. <laughs> <laughs> and about the medical marijuana patients and caregivers in Maine who are uneasy about a potentially recreational future. They can hang out with the caregivers in Humboldt who are also <laughs> uneasy with it. <laughs> you know, I think Colorado caregivers are still pretty uneasy with what we have here three years in, but producer Vince, how are you doing, man? You know, I'm awake and I'm here right now, which is pretty amazing. Our viewers next week will be, you know, they'll be given the opportunity to see what I've been working on for the last several days straight without a break, without thinking. And our trip from California, it'll have a lot about, you know, Prop 64, what's going on in Southern California, and I can't wait to show it to everybody. So I'm well. I'll be better in a couple of days when it's shared. How are you, Ricardo? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good, man. You know, and, and just a shout out to the work that Vince has been doing. Uh, seriously, we spent uh, a lot of time with Willie Nelson in San Diego on the Honeysuckle Rose. Uh, check out his video. Two and a half minutes, quick in and out. Uh, you will learn something about Willie and his relationship with cannabis. And now this next piece. Uh, is a short documentary film, about 15 minutes long, that'll be out next week, um, right before the election, and uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. We put a lot of work into it, and yeah, I can verify that Vince has spent about a good 40 hours editing <laughs> that piece, uh, and I saw it yesterday as we were putting fin uh, finishing touches on it. Very, very uh, exciting. But uh, Vince, I think it's time that we jump right into the weekend weed. You know, I considered hijacking this and airing like a minute and a half of the doc and letting people see it and tease it, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna make them all wait and watch the weekend weed first and a couple other things I'm, I'm sure. Let's do it, brother, let's all get right. into it. All right, all right. <laughs> We're starting this weekend weed in Arizona, Massachusetts, and other states where Colorado officials have been campaigning against legalization efforts using unreliable data on crime, traffic, deaths, and teen drug abuse. And here's a clip of one of those ads running in Arizona where former Colorado Governor Bill Owens and former Denver Mayor Wellington Webb warned voters against legalization. Four years ago, Colorado voted to legalize marijuana. Colorado now leads the nation in the teen use of marijuana. Marijuana edibles are marketed to children and marijuana-related traffic deaths have increased 62%. We were promised new money for education. Instead, that money's gone to marijuana regulation in the pot industry. Denver schools got nothing. In one Colorado hospital, 50% of newborns tested had marijuana in their system. Don't repeat our terrible mistake. Now, in addition to those ads, Denver District Attorney Mitch Morrissey also wrote a letter that utilizes the same illegitimate data. Uh, and we spoke with John Hudak, who is a leading researcher who studies cannabis legalization at the nonpartisan Brookings Institute. And he said much of the information being spread is either wrong or completely misleading. And here's what Hudak had to say about the ads and Morrissey's letter. Quote, if you have to rely on false data or lies, you're probably not winning the argument. The district attorney's letter shows a pretty strategic use of data that ends up being insulting to the public. And keep in mind, he's nonpartisan. He doesn't have, uh, you know, he doesn't have anything, anything at stake here. Uh, but the public servants um, in these ads, in this letter, are saying that crime in Denver is up because of marijuana. Uh, but the Denver Police Department tells us that legalization has not had a significant impact on major crimes in the city. Yeah, Ricardo, the public servants are saying that teen cannabis use is up and that traffic deaths related to marijuana are also up. But data from the state of Colorado says teen use is flat in the legal era and that there is no evidence that legal weed has made our roads any less safe. In fact, as we've talked about on the show before, 
go back into archives, watch it. The number <laughs> of people arrested for driving under the influence of marijuana dropped between 2014 and 2015, the State Patrol reported. You know, most of what these public servants are, are saying, the statistics, they come from an organization called the Rocky Mountain High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area. Um, that's a federally funded agency that fights the illegal drug trade. But the Brookings Institute's HUDAC says that this organization called HIDAS, their, hi their report is, quote, garbage, garbage. Uh, according to HUDAC. And when we had the head of Colorado's Department of Health on the show just a few weeks ago, he also noted that state and federal data is always more legitimate than that of HIDA and other organizations with an agenda. And at the end of our story on these lies that are being spread, Hudak said he expects more from people who say they are committed to public service. And I, I think I'm going to agree with him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, elsewhere in the weekend, Weed, we have a lot to get to. Um, we take you to California, where we ask the question, if California voters legalize cannabis next week, Will that signal the end of federal marijuana prohibition? I mean, just think about it. California is America's most populous state with 39 million residents. It's the world's sixth largest economy if it stood on its own, and it's the world's most important hub for cannabis cultivation and, you know, overall marijuana 420 culture. So true. So will California prove to be a tipping point for a federal government that has remained largely hands-off on this still controversial issue? Well, here's what Troy Dayton of the ArcView Group thinks. He says, quote, if this passes in California, and particularly, particularly if it passes in the other four states, it lights out, it's lights out for marijuana prohibition. You know, if the five states voting on recreational marijuana next week, if they all say yes to legal weed, that means that nearly a quarter of Americans will have access to retail cannabis. Um, already, more than half of Americans have access to medical marijuana, and four other states are voting on medical cannabis next week as well. That said, California has said no to retail pot before, twice, in 1972 and again in 2010. But with every poll saying that the state's Proposition 64 is going to pass, I'm going to make a bold prediction <laughs> that we will be talking about legal California cannabis on next week's Week in Weed here on The Cannabis Show. Oh, man, it's a big one. That will be a show you don't want to miss, an election special, if you will. Uh, now, lastly, in The Week in Weed, we take you up north where Canada's largest pharmacy chain has formally applied to be a distributor of medical marijuana. And this is huge news. I say it a lot, but this is with the Canadian chain Shoppers Drug Mart saying, quote, we have no intention of producing medical marijuana, but we do want the ability to dispense medical marijuana to our patients in conjunction with counseling from a pharmacist. You know, think about that and imagine if it was happening stateside, where CVS and Walgreens were applying to sell medical cannabis. Uh, Vince is right, this is huge, and it speaks to how fast things are moving in Canada. And Ricardo, it is worth reminding everybody that Canada's health minister will introduce legislation on recreational legalization in the spring. So we're not that far from an adult use future up north in Canada. You know, the quick hit is taking a week off today, so it's time to bring out our first guest. Very excited about, about this. Um, when I first wrote about him, I called him, quote, one of the most exciting entrepreneurs in the legal cannabis space, and he remains that. He started the 420 Games, Power Plant Fitness, and the New West Summit. It's my pleasure to welcome Jim McAlpine to The Cannabis Show. Hey, Jim. Hey, Ricardo. Welcome to Good Denver, to man. You, Good to be here. <laughs> Good to see you. Last I saw you was about two weeks ago when you were wrapping uh, New West Summit. How did that go? A successful event? Yeah, it was fantastic. Thanks for coming. You added a lot to our journalism panel. I had a lot of fun. Um, yeah, it was a great. It was only our second year doing it. It grew immensely. And to me, it signifies the professionalism of this industry. And we're rapidly moving in that direction so quickly. I felt that New West really exemplified professionalism, and that's where this whole industry is moving. Well, props. We talked about it on the show, I, I believe, two weeks ago. But um, you know, my GM Brad Bogus and I, who he's been on the show before, we just had a, a really outstanding time, and and noted on the way back that we just met a really high caliber level of uh, of businessman and businesswoman out there, people working in this industry to, you know, to move things forward. And I thought that, that your event, the New West Summit, really drew those people who were making stuff happen. 
Well, coming from you, that means a lot to me, so thank you. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, yeah, I can't wait till next year 3.0. You know, we're, we're shooting for the stars on the next one. There you go, there you go. <laughs> uh, well, we should note too that you guys are the first guests with our new cannabis show mugs, <laughs> huh? Let's cheers Check to out that. These. Yeah, cheers to the new mugs. You guys look pretty sweet. Right. <laughs> and if you were on uh, one of our last four shows, five shows, and if Vince owes you a mug because we <laughs> ran out. Tweet me, um, I'm so sorry, <laughs> at Vinny Chant. <laughs> Tweet Vince. Uh, Jim, we're hopping in, Indica Sativa. Where are you at on the spectrum? You know, I've always been more of an indica guy. I kind of like that heavy, head high. And honestly, I've thought a lot about that question before because everybody talks about that. Sure. And as I've kind of moved on in my cannabis consumption, becoming more of a connoisseur, if you will, I think less about indica sativa and more about terpene profiles. Mm. And as I kind of move into the, the concentrate stuff, just look at the full flavor of what I'm, what I'm medicating with versus just indica or sativa. But if you make me choose, I'm going to choose <laughs> indica. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Well, let's jump into the terpene uh, question then, because I think there's a lot of interesting things that we're learning about this. But uh, how, does, how does the terpene profile of a concentrate or flower affect what you might be um, vaporizing or smoking at that time? Um, you know, I'm going to defer to a deeper answer on this to your next guest, Sabo Shen, who, <laughs> his unit to me, it's called the Vape Exhale, and I started, I used to look at concentrate kind of poorly, and you, you bring out the, um, the flame and all the stuff, it kind of had a bad connotation to me, it looked druggy-esque in a way to me, sure. so using um, the Vape Exhale kind of really gave me my first experience le truthfully tasting concentrate, because I think I was using it and it was too hot. Um, and it was burning too much. So when I really nuanced and used the vape exhale, which lets you heat it the right way, it's just, to me, outside of, of so much the, the high that you get, it's also, it's like drinking wine. It's like there's so many wonderful flavors to experience and, and it, there's a vast amount of them. So to me, it's like, I love just taking a tiny little hit of a concentrate and just really, it's like taking a sip of wine, you know, in a sommelier type way. Sure, sure, yeah, looking forward to getting Sabo out here. Um, definitely gonna talk about the vape exhale, and I will, uh, I, I will concur because I really enjoy the smallest hit of, uh, of a concentrate and, and have learned a lot in the last year about how to many people using extracts, it really is about the flavor and it's not everything, it's just about the 90% potency or the strongest shatter you can score. And I think that's kind of lovely because of course if this is the essence of the marijuana flower, then it should be about the flavor and the smell and, and extracts really can be about that and so that's how I choose to use them as well. So. Absolutely. You know, one quick thing on that note, I've tried like 99% pure crystalline THC and it's, you feel, you feel it, but it's like drinking Everclear in a way. There's no flavor and it kind of loses all that nuance that you were just talking sure, about. So, sure. Yeah, I like it too. I think it's like a new elevated consumer that's figuring out, you know, especially what's given that concentrates and extracts are the, still the hottest segment of this market that we're here discussing. Uh, but Jim, um, you are a busy man, I've learned, in our, in our <laughs> short friendship, but I talked with you before the 420 Games came out here to Denver Boulder. Um, you obviously had me out to New West Summit. Kind of give us the quick rundown on all of the different things that you do in this space um, with a quick sentence maybe describing each one. Okay, cool. Um, it was about two and a half years ago when my ski industry company started to wane because of the drought, and my first venture was the 420 Games which are athletic events to destigmatize both the plant cannabis and the people that use the plant in a healthy and responsible manner. Sure. So they're much like, you know, Tough Mudder, Color Run, other things. They're just advocacy runs to show a different face of what a cannabis user is versus that stoner stigma. And I like that everybody gets to the 420 uh, runners. <laughs> <laughs> we are one. <laughs> we all use the same number, which is 420 at the 420 <laughs> games. Um, from that, I, which I thought of at 18 years old, I founded Power Plant Fitness. Um, I started off working a little with Ricky Williams and I'm now working with a, a vast amount of different professional athletes. Um, it is the world's first cannabis gym, fitness, and wellness center. So we allow people to use cannabis while they're working out. I should say before or after, it's not like you're taking bong hits at the bench press. <laughs> sure. And it's done in a really cognitive, professional manner. Um, and it's opening in San Francisco in 2017. 
Uh, from there, I started the New West Summit, which is a <laughs> technology-based uh, future of cannabis show, really kind of like the tech crunch of Disrupt, really showing, you know, if anything is going to uh, proliferate the future of cannabis from hydration to seed to cloning to outside of the plant, there's a one-word answer, and it's technology, and that's what that show's about. And then my final venture, I'm partners with Sabo, who's going to be on next, as we said, and it's called Canna Athlete, and it's the world's first cannabis athletic product line. Oh, wow. Yeah. And this is more um, products like protein shakes or something? I mean, I, I don't even know. More energy drinks or something? Or Yeah, well, we're really focused on microdosing. So on the edible products, we want to allow people to, to come into the marketplace and not get too high for their first experience. So we have an activation spray. Oh. It's literally coconut oil and some other products with THC, and each spray is only one milligram of THC. Oh, sure. Um, we've got another thing, like, like, much like the Cliff Block. It's a blood orange chia seed energy gel with electrolytes, um, and it's much like the little gummy Cliff Blocks. But all made to be low sugar, many of them are vegan, and just focused with the athletic mindset. Ah, I look forward to hearing more about that. Okay, that, that's, that one's new to me, but obviously, clearly, you have a lot going on. I surprised you with something good. I know, <laughs> there you go. Um, I want to I learn about your history and your relationship with cannabis, um, especially with, with high-functioning people in this industry. I always find that they have a very unique relationship with the plant, so do you ingest daily? multiple times a day? Is there a time of day that you prefer? And also, how does marijuana help you get done what needs to get done? Um, great question. I love your pink vans with the skulls on them, by the right? way. Those are Thanks. pretty rad. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm a daily cannabis user multiple times a day. I mostly eat edibles. Um, I will use the vape exhale sometimes uh, when I want to kind of feel it right away and, and more of an immediate gratification. But I'm more of an edibles guy than anything, and most of the other time I use vape exhale. Um, I've used on a daily basis since I was uh, 18 years old. Um, wow. And, and you're how old now? I'm 46 now. Okay. And pretty much, you know, aside from quitting for a month here or a month there for whatever, I've really been a daily cannabis user since I was 18 or a little younger. Um, and it helps me focus. I'm going to be succinct and quick about this because it's something Steve D'Angelo said and it really just rung so true to me. Mm -hmm. um, I've used cannabis and kind of thought I was a stoner through high school and into college and just kind of because of the way the media portrayed it, it's like, oh, I'm a stoner too, I like to smoke weed. But it was in college where I realized, hey, when I go to the gym and I don't smoke weed, my workouts aren't as good and I'm less focused and I'm bored and I leave earlier and when I smoke a little bit, I'm there for twice as long with the eye of the tiger pumping, pumping reps out. And then I noticed my schoolwork, like I couldn't really do a great job writing my term papers because my mind's a bit ADD. and I used cannabis to write all my term papers. So I realized at that point, I'm not a stoner. I'm actually using this plant for a beneficial you know, way to um, hone my mind because I have ADD. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really in college and that's, that's, I kind of shifted the way I used it then and I didn't quite use it so much in, um, in a relaxation fashion so much. I, I probably was a bit of a stoner in college, but now I use it every day <laughs> just to focus. It's, it's my drug rather than Ritalin or Adderall or things that people use for focus. I use cannabis instead. Wow, uh, that's amazing. I mean, we're talking about almost 30 years of continuous use, and it continues to help you focus. Um, can you compare cannabis with, uh, with your treating your ADD compared to a pharmaceutical, and, and how the two differ, and why you choose cannabis over those? Yeah, um, I've tried those other, you know, the Ritalin and that kind of stuff, and they felt speedy to me, I guess. They just kind of sure. made me feel a little shaky and a l little bit of a pill hangover sometimes. And I just really, I don't even drink coffee, so I don't like that kind of speedy feeling. And so that alone was, a, a, the, the side effect was worse than the benefit for me, you know? Wow, And sure. with cannabis, you know, I've never had a hangover before. Um, I don't necessarily need it, like I can function without it. But like, like Steve D'Angelo also said, cannabis makes the thing, things in your life that you love, it accentuates them and it makes you love them that little bit more, appreciate them that little bit more. So um, I think I've just nuanced my way up through now where I feel like I'm a bit of a connoisseur and I've learned a lot through these last few years getting my medical card too because you know, understanding what I'm putting in my body is a big key to be 
doing it the right way. Absolutely, especially since we now can understand it and know the difference between what we bought this week versus last week, which, you know, in past markets, especially black markets, uh, we didn't have that luxury. <laughs> so um, I, I want to ask you, Jim, because one of my favorite parts about New West Summit, which was your event two weeks ago in San Francisco, um, was the keynote. And, and you know, <laughs> Richard Branson Skyped in from the island he owns. What's it, Mackinac? Necker. Necker, Necker Island. Necker Island. <laughs> and, and just spoke with us for 15 minutes in a really illuminating way. I want to know what the one takeaway was that you took away from, from, from his conversation with us there. I think it was quote unquote, screw it and do it, was his advice to uh, <laughs> cannabis entrepreneurs, which yeah. really exemplified to me. So many people sit around thinking like, oh, should I do this? Are people gonna judge me? You know, like, you gotta just jump in and do it. You know, and the way Richard said it was, was brilliant. You know, it was very straightforward. Just screw it and do it. And, uh, and he said that's kind of what he's done in his business ventures and look where it's got him. <laughs> if my back wasn't hurt right now, I would do the dance that I did when I got the phone call that Richard Branson was going to do our show because I was ecstatic. I really think that he put the cherry on the Sunday of what New West Summit was. and. I'm, uh, I put an invite in to Elon Musk to join us next year, so hopefully we'll have both <laughs> Richard and Elon with us next oh year. Oh man, you mentioned that to me at the after party. I wasn't <laughs> sure if that was public, but I'm glad you made it public. And Elon, come on. Come on, Elon. Hang with us in San Francisco <laughs> next year. Uh, we have lots more to talk about, but um, that's waiting for a few minutes. So thanks for joining us. All right, it's my pleasure. Great to see you in Colorado, man. Right. Now, I want to throw to our very own wizard of weed, that's Professor Pat for this week's entry in the new cannabis lexicon. Diffuser, part of many heady glass rigs and water pipes. Diffusers come in many configurations, but their purpose is the same, to add additional sites for the fermentation of bubbles, as well as help with airflow. Diffusers and all the agitation that they create help to cool the smoke or vapor prior to inhalation, which makes it smoother on the lungs and often more flavorful. For example, this piece has a six-hole diffuser, and it hits super smooth. <laughs> Thank you for that, Professor Pat. It's always educational. Uh, now, our next guest is also making his first appearance on the show. And after seeing him speak in San Francisco a couple weeks ago, I'm excited to introduce you all to Vape Exhale founder, Sabo Shen. Welcome him to the Cannabis Show. How's it going, Sabo? Ah, very good. Thank you for having me. <laughs> hey, man. Thanks for coming out. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh. We've never done one of those here, so. The producer told me uh, that's what we should I, do. I think I've floated it for 83 <laughs> episodes now, and this is the first time someone's taken me up on it. <laughs> Classic Vince. Classic producer Vince. Uh, we have an all California couch today. I am psyched about that. I appreciate you guys coming out, and we're going to get to some very pressing issues. Uh, but first, Sabo, Indica Sativa. Where are you at on the spectrum? Uh, on the spectrum, I'm more, uh, when I was younger, more definitely a sativa guy. Um, mm -hmm. As I got older, um, turned more into an indica guy. Uh, unlike most people, it seems like my energy levels have seemed to go greater as I get older in age. So I find much more um, therapeutic utility with the indicas today. Wow, that's great. Congratulations. Thank I you. think most Thank of us you. tend to lose some of that energy with age, but you're clearly doing something right. Thanks. <laughs> um, Sabo, you have an unusual backstory in terms of finding cannabis as a pain management tool, but also setting out to develop what you called the world's best vaporizer, which is a very big, uh, big aim. So can you share this story about finding cannabis and then setting out to create what eventually became the Vape Exhale? Sure. Um, in, in college, uh, I always wanted to grow up to become a professional athlete. Um, I was doing a lot of combat sports like uh, kickboxing and boxing. Uh -huh. um, I also, in order to make ends meet, I worked as a stuntman in Hollywood. Um, up until that point, no drinking, no drugs have been in my body, um, but through a lot of uh, dangerous stunts like jumping off of buildings or through windows, you know, started accumulating quite a bit of injuries. So um, I started taking anywhere up to like four to eight Advils a night. Over the course of four to five months, it started making a big hole in my stomach and I realized I needed a different way to deal with this pain. Uh, my roommate who was, uh, he was also a stunt man, um, told me, you know, why don't you just try cannabis? Uh, he consumed cannabis every day. Um, I just thought that that was for him. Um, that was his way. And for me, you know, I was just going to, you know, just lead a clean and healthy lifestyle. Uh, but 
as most people, when the pain is too much and you start getting desperate, you're like, sure, I'll try it. So the first time I tried cannabis, uh, not only did it give me a lot of physical relief, but it, it also just kind of took me out of my own perspective for the very first time. I was able to, you know, kind of like more objectively judge myself and my own actions, which a lot of it, quite honestly, I was like, that guy is a really annoying, aggressive guy, you know, but at the same hmm. time, you know, I think kind of having that shift in consciousness, it made me more curious about cannabis and how we could leverage cannabis to find out more about ourselves. Interesting. Wow. So are you still in touch with your old roommate? Uh, I am still in touch with him. You so. kind of owe him uh, a debt of gratitude in a way. <laughs> yeah, he actually uh, he, he emailed me the other day. He asked uh, if he could purchase one of our devices, so he's part of the family now. <laughs> oh, great. Well, th then tell me how that brought you to this place where you became an entrepreneur in this space and wanted to develop uh, a vaporizer. Yeah, so um, after college, um, I had worked as a stuntman, but uh, uh, once I realized you know, that wasn't really going to pay the bills, I started working in Silicon Valley. I worked in various sales and business development roles. Uh, all five companies I worked for um, all had successful exits. Um, around the third company, mm. which was Success Factors, um, when they went, uh, when Microsoft acquired them, um, everyone was extremely happy in the company, um, except for me. You know, I was mildly happy. Um, I knew my bank account was growing, but fundamentally, mm -hmm. you know, like I saw everyone celebrating and you know, I wasn't, you know, I was kind of acting like them and I was like high-fiving everybody, but deep down I knew like, I need to find something different, otherwise I'm gonna be 80 years old and... You needed purpose. Correct, correct. So I said, if the next company has a successful exit, I'm gonna jump and go do my own thing. And the next company I worked for did have a successful exit, so I had to, you know, keep up to my own promises and do my own thing. And ultimately, um, it was because I had been buying vaporizers uh, uh, from the time I discovered cannabis um, and not really being satisfied with their performance, you know, whether it was how potent it was or the flavor mm -hmm. or even down to, you know, are they using the right materials that are, you know, healthy to use? You know, you'd be surprised. A lot of them have plastic right next to the heater. You know, it doesn't take an engineer to realize, oh, heat and plastic, it smells <laughs> funny. I'm inhaling it. You know, maybe this worse. is a, yes, yes. <laughs> so you know, um, after uh, the fourth company uh, had the successful exit, I told my wife what I wanted to do. She was very supportive of it, and it was off to the races. Wow! And 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 just for a, a lot of our readers probably don't aren't familiar with the Silicon Valley terminology. So exit meaning uh, exit means um, if the company files a, a IPO or a larger company acquires it for some ungodly amount of money. So these were startups and they eventually kind of graduated from startupdom and and had these exits that allowed you to make an investment in a company. That's cool. Correct. I'm happy you clarified that because I was going a totally different direction with what that meant. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to know this because um, we, I was I was at your panel at New West, mm -hmm. very interesting stuff, but one of the things I've noticed is that some of the new devices, and I wonder if Vape Exhale is part of this, um, have kind of opened up concentrates and extracts to the masses, perhaps to like an older generation of cannabis aficionados or even a younger generation that's afraid of dabbing just because of some of the reasons that Jim and I were talking about earlier. It, it looks pretty aggressive. Yeah, you know, um, when we first designed the Vape XL Evo, it was predominantly for flowers. Um, that was what was popular back then. Uh, we knew concentrates were gaining popularity, we just didn't know how popular it would be. But ultimately, um, what really uh, made us focus on a better delivery model for oil was when, um, after one of the PTA meetings at our school, one of the other parents wanted to come over and he said, hey, I have a, a, a joint, do you want to smoke it with me? And I said, hey, I got this thing called a dab rig. It's essentially like smoking the entire joint in one inhalation. <laughs> and he said, oh, that sounds fabulous. Mm -hmm. So after uh, uh, the PTA meeting was over, he comes over to my house and then he sees me with the torch and the nail and he's like, 
what are we doing here? I thought we were going to consume cannabis. And I said, oh, no, I'm just getting the dab rig set up. Long story short is our kids never had play dates after that. And I realized, you know, oh. this socially looks really bad to someone <laughs> that has, even someone that smokes blunts, you know, sure. or joints. You know, if they have no kind of prior history with this, you know, you scare people away. And the optics are, they can take somebody by surprise, right, if you're not familiar with that setup of a nail and Absolutely. a butane torch. Absolutely. And then, you know, uh, um, I've seen the, the vape pens, which are very stealthy and convenient, and um, they allow uh, people to medicate in situations that they normally can't medicate. But for individuals like myself or like Jim that, who has a bad back, you know, having a larger dose of cannabinoids, being able to inhale them without any you know, irritation to the throat, mm -hmm. you know, that's when a device like ours um, really shines because uh, currently all of the uh, concentrates consumption devices on the m uh, market utilize conductive heat, which is surface to surface contact. So think of that as grilling or frying your concentrate, whereas our device is like putting your concentrate into an easy bake oven. So it's a gentler, more thorough, more efficient extraction. So mm. not only do you use less, but you also get to taste the full terpenes and flavonoid profiles of each strain. Sure. Okay. That makes sense. So yeah. you should have named it the easy baked oven. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe easy dab like oven. <laughs> easy dab oven. <laughs> um, Sabo, there was a particularly interesting panel at New West um, on vape technology. I remember uh, my GM and I walked in early waiting for Branson mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and you guys were up there talking and both of us just were instantly hanging on every word because uh, just to have those minds mm -hmm. on a single panel all talking about stuff that we're passionate about as journalists and consumers and people following this industry. So I'm just wondering if you as a leader in the space can give us a quick state of the industry, vaporization, cannabis um, uh, presentation here on the fly. Uh, in terms of what are you seeing, what should we be seeing more of for responsible manufacturing in vaporizer tech? Um, what's up with the FDA and what they're saying about um, e-cigarettes and then also you know what's next in 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 this vape space which is clearly so popular as Jim and I mentioned the uh, the concentrates and extracts are the number one fastest growing segment in the cannabis market so what's the state of the industry Wow <laughs> such a simple question <laughs> uh, yeah, um, right. <laughs> so the great news is for the consumer it's never been better um, most of the major vaporizers that you see at the store, at the dispensary, at the head shop, you know, aren't these vaporizers that I was talking about that have, you know, the the air path that may be made with materials that are less than satisfactory. Uh, most of them, I would say, deliver a pretty good performance. For most people today, I would say, you know, just look at your own cannabis consumption habits, and that will tell you the type of vaporizer that uh, will most likely fit your lifestyle. If you mainly consume at home, then a desktop vaporizer like ours is great. If you live at home with your parents and you need to go out and consume cannabis, well, maybe a Pax Firefly or an e-cigarette would, be, uh, would be best. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the future, I think that what we're really seeing is that people are looking at dosing and titration very carefully, you know, really to help the new cannabis curious user um, come into the market and have a positive experience. Uh, many are focused on convenience and stealth, uh, where Vape Exhale uh, has primarily focused on is strictly the user experience, which is how does this vaporizer make me feel? How does the vaporizer taste? Um, and and, and what, what are kind of like the more kind of ambiguous effects that, you know, like why you would like wine? So we've always been focused on, you know, this higher end of the market because we knew that at some point, mm -hmm. you know, when you get used to the convenience, you get used to the stealth, you're going to want something that tastes better, that hits you harder, that makes you feel better. And that's where we're focusing a lot of our technology on to ensure that um, the cannabis consumer of the next generation, you know, really has a device that is congruent with, you know, all the other devices that they use at their house, like, you know, their, uh, their Keurig um, uh, sure. coffee maker, you know, something equivalent to that, but with cannabis. So you mentioned something interesting, though, because I think more and more this consumer is passionate about dose and an accurate dose and knowing exactly what that means, not just how it makes them feel, but 
um, how many milligrams of activated THC they're they're ingesting, you know, and and with edibles we're getting closer to that exactness to know that oh yeah this is a five milligram dose this is ten milligram dose. Do you see that dosage becoming more exacting in the vaporizer space in the future? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've been working on technology to help you meter the dosage. Um, you know, one of the things that we've always heard is, especially if someone has had a good experience in the past, is how do we replicate that? So what we try to do is not only ask them what type of devices that they're using, but really figure out what strain it was. Mm -hmm. um, if we look at that strain, then we start looking at the terpene profile and we're like, we understand that it might be high in myrcene or limonene or pinene. Then it also gives us an idea of what other strains might be good for this individual. And ultimately, you know, for me, I think you've heard me use this word numerous times is it's the user experience that matters most for us and we're really focusing on trying to figure out you know is it microdosing is it the flavor is it being able to choose your own adventure well mm -hmm. the answer is it's all of those things but for different people uh, they have different priorities for each we're just trying to make sure that we create devices that are congruent with each of those lifestyles Sure, sure. That's good news. Yeah, and I've, I've heard of some vape pens coming out and, oh yeah, you know if you hit it, you know it's a five milligram dose. I, I, I've wondered uh, as to the accuracy of that, but I do want to bring Jim back into the conversation. Um, I love that you guys are both visiting us from California, obviously in the news a lot. <laughs> um, all right, tough questions, very invasive question. Uh -oh. I apologize in I'm advance, scared. but next week, how are you voting on Proposition 64? with one sentence on why, starting with Jim. I am voting yes on Prop 64. Uh, I think that the benefits outweigh incarceration and all the other things that come along with keeping it illegal. And it's not perfect, but I'm voting for it. All right, Sabo? I'm voting yes on 64 because, as Jim said, while it's not perfect, well, we could wait another four years for yet another not perfect bill. So. It's very important for us to get this in, and I'm sure that we'll make the right things happen. Oh, I appreciate that. Okay. Two yeses. Can we uh, ask your opinion? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, you can definitely ask. <laughs> 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 um, but as a journalist, we make, we make a point of not taking sides. Understood. Um, it's been fascinating, and Vince and I did spend a bunch of time in uh, Southern California actually uh, researching and talking to folks, um, to f talking to industry who's against it, and talking to the people who you'd expect to be against it. And, of course, the other side as well. And I think there are a lot of good points. And um, judging from every poll that's, uh, that's, that's out there right now, I'd have to go with Vince and say, we're going to be sitting here next week talking about legal California weed. Um, there, there's momentum. And that's undeniable from the LA Times to the OC Register to Survey USA Today. So it sounds like you guys are going to have a lot of work ahead of you. And uh, judging from my time in, uh, in Northern California with you guys, um, I think there's also a, a very steep learning curve, uh, a lot to be learned and uh, a lot, uh, you know, uh, almost having to bring together an industry that's very divided at this moment um, moving into the election. So <laughs> I, I think there's a lot to be done and uh, um, a lot of that is just straight up education. So. I, it'll come naturally. Um, but I know you guys are also both passionate about the role of cannabis and exercise. Jim, you mentioned earlier that you guys are now business partners on an endeavor, so I want to hear more about that. But, um, you know, also I want to hear e how each of you guys know that there is a legit connection between cannabis enhancing exercise, working out, um, activity. Uh, especially since it's known for more of a sedentary lifestyle and as we all know that's an, a pretty undeserved reputation but starting with you Jim uh, how do you know this it seems like you learned it at a pretty early age <laughs> <laughs> for me I've known it's worked for myself personally a long time I like to use examples so Michael Phelps fastest man ever in water Usain Bolt fastest man ever on land both known <laughs> cannabis users you know Ricky Williams Tim Lincecum I could go on forever and even outside of the plant, you know, but um, I think that kind of data s is suggestive that it works and or at least is not damaging. And um, personally, I think it's just my experience over 30 years of using it almost every day and taking some breaks and understanding how it works for me. Um, I know it works. Um, 
I do preface really quickly that I don't think cannabis is for everyone and it's very important to know yourself and there's certain people athletically that shouldn't use cannabis as sure. well. So my, my biggest thing that I want to tell everybody is I don't tell everyone they should use it. They should consider it and maybe give it a try, but it isn't for everybody. And I appreciated that. When you and I talked about power plant, I asked you straight up, is this for everybody? I mean, are people going to be on the treadmills at your gyms getting stoned? And you're like, no, there's a separate location for that and also there's a, a meeting process process with a trainer where they determine f your first workout at your power plant when it opens next year is without weed, right? Yeah, it's called the Cannabis Performance Assessment and your baseline workout is sober so we can understand how the cannabis does affect your workout if it's positive or negative. Sure, and then uh, potentially a second workout with weed. Sabo, uh, I mean, obviously this isn't a performance enhancing drug, is it? But 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 more, more uh, allowing for focus in uh, practice and rehearsal rehearsal and all these kinds of things, or do you think it is a performance enhancing drug? You know, what's interesting is a lot of the professional athletes that Jim and I know, um, they happen to be VapeXL customers, and when I saw that they were, I was extremely excited to reach out to them and ask them, you know, how are you using this? I, I totally expected them to tell me that it was for recovery purposes, that mm -hmm. it was with CBD or to help them relax, but I was surprised at how many of them told me that it helped them before practice. Um, I myself like to consume cannabis if I ran or swam, but mm -hmm. you know I also do martial arts. And for me, like practicing martial arts uh, after medicating, it didn't seem like a good idea until I met uh, Denny Prokopos, who's a three-time Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu world champion, hmm. who I saw on TV wearing a cannabis leaf while he won his third world championship. And I thought. <laughs> I got to learn more about this guy, and he happened to live in San Francisco as well. And um, so I'm 40 now. Um, when I was 38, I met Denny. I began training in jiu-jitsu with him. Um, he started showing me how he incorporated it uh, uh, before practice, during practice, and after practice. And I wanted to see if it was a performance enhancer because it told he told me it allowed him to see different things, to react quicker, and to essentially be an enhanced version of himself. And um, since training with Denny, I've begun competing myself. Um, oh, my, cool. my very first match, um, even though I trained in an activated state um, all the time, I, I was nervous because, well, you know, I was training with teammates. Now here's another guy that essentially wants to choke <laughs> me out, you know, and be very aggressive about it. And I just wasn't too sure if I should medicate before my first competition. Long story short is I lost that match in six minutes. Um, I vowed to myself that I, next time I competed, I would compete the same way that I trained. So uh, since then, I've had three matches. Uh, the combined total time has been a minute and 47 seconds. All victories for myself. So hmm. it showed me that, as Jim said, not for everyone, but if you understand how to use it and you can implement it, um, it very much can put you into flow state, which is when you make your fastest best decisions autonom uh, autonomically without having to process the moves in your head. And when you are competing at the highest levels, fractions of seconds count. And I think that based on my results, I mean, I'm still going to compete some more and I'm sure I won't be undefeated, but sure. based on how I performed without cannabis and with cannabis, it, it's very clear to me that used properly, it is indeed a, a performance enhancer. And this, well, this is fascinating, and I love that story. Thank <laughs> you for sharing, because so much of the conversation revolving around cannabis and at least professional athletics right now is, is it performance enhancing? And many cannabis activists have, have made the point that it's not, which is why um, NFL, MLB, these major, league, um, these major leagues shouldn't be testing for it. So Jim, what do you think? Is it perform performance enhancing? You know, to me, p performance enhancing means an unfair advantage, like taking a steroid that other people can't. So athletes can drink Red Bull and caffeine before an event. It's kind of the same thing. Like, if you, if you want to use this, I think it's something any athlete should be given that option to do, just like they can use caffeine. And a real quick analogy that I think opens up the mind, or at least lets people see the athletic connection and this flow state comment Sabo made, Flow state is when you're in the zone, you know, when you're not thinking about it. Sure. Like, if you're skiing, you're just skiing. You're not thinking when you're going to turn. Think about the two cultures that have been accepted to be able to use cannabis, musicians and artists forever. Um, <laughs> and those two go into a flow state. If you see a musician just ripping a guitar or an artist just in the zone doing his art, 
that's flow state as well. And when you're an athlete, you want to achieve that same type of thing where you're not thinking at all. You're just doing, and it's training that gets you there. So mm -hmm. I think it's a great story the way Sabo told it because the way he trained, he didn't compete and he didn't win. And then when he went in confident and did it the way he trained, he was victorious. So I think that analogy about flow state, it can go outside of athletics, and cannabis can be a gateway to open your mind up for everything. It is a gateway drug right here, Jim McAlpine saying it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm curious. So you guys would both agree that it is a performance enhancing drug then, right? Uh, you know, That's what I it mean, sounds like. Performance enhancing and semantics is always funny because oh, sure. I would say like <laughs> if you live near a Whole Foods, you know, that's performance enhancing versus someone that doesn't have access to that type of food. So where do you draw the line? And mm -hmm. I, I tend to kind of believe what Jim believes, which is it doesn't give you like that unfair, unnatural uh, advantage that, um, uh, uh, that like a steroid would, but it just allowed me to get out of my own way and perform the way that I performed in practice. More about focus than strength. I believe so. So yeah. absolutely. A, and ultimately, what I think is most important is be, uh, these athletes being allowed to use the CBD as a neuroprotectant, mm -hmm. as a way for recovery. And sometimes I do feel that talking about the performance enhancement uh, gets us into like a cyclical argument because, well, we have to define what performance enhancement is. And ultimately, I think what we can all agree on is CBD is great, anti-inflammatory, it's a neuroprotectant, and it's great for the athletes to have as an option. For many people, it could make you a better athlete. Let's let's put it like that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing I know the answer to this, but do you guys think that these major leagues should be testing for cannabis in 2016 heading into 17? Jim? You know, I'm going to give you a bit of a surprising answer. I think that every team should have the ability to do what they want. If you're going to pay someone millions and millions of dollars, I think you do have the right to say to your players, like they say you can't go skiing, you know, you can't go out because you might break your leg. If, if that's what that owner of that team, This Is America, believes in, I believe they should have the right to do that. But I don't think that the league should be testing for it. It shouldn't be mandatory by the NFL or any other league. Um, mm -hmm. I do still kind of stick up for the right for an individual team to test their players if they so choose. I don't agree with that. It's the right that I agree with, but the league's it's kind no. of the sporting equivalent to the Colorado model's idea of local control. We're going to legalize it in these state boundaries, but then each municipality has the opportunity to ban the recreational businesses if they so choose. Yeah, and I mean, honestly, I don't think any of those teams should test, but again, mm -hmm. when you're paying a guy $48 million, you should be able to pretty much tell him you need to do this and you can't do this. I, yeah. You know, that's a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> Sabo, where are you standing yeah, on you it? Know, I, I couldn't agree more with Jim. You know, the only place that I would add a little bit of color is just that I believe that we should have sovereignty of our own consciousness and our body regardless of what anyone says. And as long as you're not hurting anyone, I think we should be allowed to have that sovereignty of our consciousness and body. Uh, but I also respect the right of someone that's paying an athlete a lot of money <laughs> to say, hey, you know, I'd like it that if you don't ride motorcycles and you don't consume There'll be weed-friendly teams and non-weed-friendly teams. <laughs> and, you know, I'm sure the weed-friendly teams are going to have more people wanting to play for them. <laughs> it's like that. How random was it in 2014 when the Broncos played the Seahawks in the Super Bowl? And it's like, <laughs> there are only two legal places in America right now, and both of them are represented How in the big How many jokes game. about Super Bowl were made that day? Oh, some really <laughs> terrible jokes and so many to answer your question. Um, lastly, I want to ask you guys about a group that you both co-founded, um, Canadads. I want to I want to hear why you started it, why you both started it, and also how you guys and others benefit from having this sounding board of other dads who responsibly use cannabis. Jim, starting with you. Um, I had looked at what a lady named Mo in Florida started called Canna Moms, mm -hmm. which was a supportive organization, and it, it's more for families with sick children to help support them in, in their journey for medical cannabis. Our organization is a little more all-encompassing. It's just to say, look, we're dads, we use cannabis, we're great dads, we are positive leaders for our children, and we wanted to set a page out there that, you know, I always think of the I am Spartacus line, but if someone steps out first, it makes it easier for the next guy to step out. And so we, me and Sabo were on the phone one day. I think I might have came up with the idea, but really it was a collective idea, and I think I said it to him, and 15 minutes later, there was a, he created a page. So <laughs> we, we co-created it and invited our friends, and it's literally just a community as a dad. I put up pictures of my daughter in little silly videos because I like to go out and do stuff with them, and I'm a cannabis user, so I want people to know that. 
And, and Sabo, what do you get out of, out, out of this group and this community that you guys have helped build? Well, quite a bit. I think that, you know, as a father, you know, there's a lot of like first time mommies groups. There's not a lot of first time daddies groups. So I always felt that, you know, fathers, not that they got the short end of the stick, but, you know, they don't really get, like when people think of parents, it's very maternal as opposed to paternal. So um, when I had my first kid, I mean, um, I had already started Vape Exhale and I always thought of myself as an entrepreneur, but it became super clear to me that day that number one it, job is being a dad. You know, more so than anything else, like the most important thing is that I be the best dad possible. So, you know, dads were kind of like not always in the limelight. Cannabis users are kind of stigmatized. So, you know, I'm a dad that uses cannabis that also works in the industry. And, you know, as I spoke to Jim, you know, we realized we had all these commonalities. And to me, it's like, like you said about the Spartacus line is if we start coming out of the closet and showing people a good, strong example of what a cannabis user who's also a father behaves, mm -hmm. looks and speaks like, then other people that, you know, might start feeling more comfortable. And, you know, there wasn't really a main purpose other than to give people a place to share these ideas. But, you know, like a lot of uh, uh, great things, you know, like the, 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 the direction it's going, it's getting more solidified and how we can utilize this group to, you know, um, promote a positive message for cannabis, for parenting, and for just being a strong male role model. He's, he's not my friend because we use marijuana in the marijuana business. He's honestly sure. one of my best friends because we're really engaged dads and we realize that about each other. And honestly, that's what made re me respect him. So cannabis brought us together, but then we figured out what our commonalities were and it really was being a dad. So I think it's just setting a great example and I'm honored to do it with this dude. Thank I would, you. I would <laughs> imagine this is that awesome. I can't wait to be a dad in a few short <laughs> weeks now. I'm like, this is so good. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Four twenty friendly dads hanging out and awesome. talking like this. And I, I agree that the fathers are never. Even oh, the yeah. pregnancy books were Neanderthal Fred Flintstones. Yeah. I mean, it superseded like running the companies, you know, which is so strange because running a company was like my identity, you know. And then now being a father, you know, it's also helped me like run the company better and just so many positive benefits from being a dad. And, and this is fun, especially because Vince is expecting here. <laughs> when, Vince? Uh, 303, Denver Day, if the child really wants to be loved. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. It's my wife's birthday. Congratulations. Congratulations. It's the day after my birthday. <laughs> we need more Pisces in the world. So we do. Do I'm your, do on your it. best, uh, Vince. <laughs> I'll talk and, to my lady. <laughs> and to your lady. Um, but I would imagine, too, that people have found this group or been invited to the group and just had their eyes opened. like. Oh, kind of that moment where they realize maybe they can come out of the closet about their own relationships with this plant. It's cool because it's a very diverse group. Um, it's really from across the country, different types of people, different colors. There's some women that have joined. There's people that don't have kids. Guys with dogs are welcome to join. <laughs> and um, yeah, we have almost 2,000 people that have organically joined this page just uh, randomly because cool. they found it over Facebook. So it's, uh, it's an eclectic group of people for sure. Well, I look forward to participating a little bit more. I know you just invited me this week, so <laughs> thank you for that. Gentlemen, great conversation today. Now it's time for a great pot quiz. Testing your current events knowledge. Right, right. Have you been reading? Uh, have you been reading marijuana news this last week? This is how we work, Jim. We're going to start with you. If you get the answer wrong, Sabo, you can steal the point. Uh oh. Vice versa. <gasps> when it's Sabo's turn. So, Jim, are you ready? Let's do this. <laughs> All right. In what state did the su state Supreme Court disqualify a medical marijuana proposal from the ballot after votes had already been cast? I'm so gonna say Florida. in what state did that just happen? Florida is not the right answer. Oh. Good guess, though. Sabo for the steal. Ooh, um, that was actually going to be my guess because whenever something crazy happens it's usually florida <laughs> that's very true <laughs> what just know it is florida man <laughs> <laughs> it is yeah, props to florida man we love florida man on this show how about um, massachusetts oh massachusetts already has medical so they are they're voting on recreational this this year but it is arkansas so Arkansas oddly has, <laughs> I know, <laughs> but you, you laugh, but they actually had two medical marijuana amendments that they were voting on, and after uh, thousands of votes had been cast, the state Supreme Court yanked one of them, uh, calling into question uh, some of their signatures. 
Wow. So it was very controversial. And now there's um, a whole other court tie-up where that group that had been yanked is now asking the Supreme Court to reinstate it. But then, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a mess down there. Arkansas, I was just going to come out and spend tons of money on my vacation in Arkansas. And I'm going to go somewhere else now. <laughs> You're not alone. I've heard of other people <laughs> boycotting the state. Um, Sabo, next question. All right. What U.S. state's recreational cannabis shops are now finally selling retail marijuana as of this last week? Which U.S. states? Yep, are recreational cannabis shops. Recreational they finally are selling shops. retail marijuana as of this last week. Of, you want me to name them all or the um, one specifically that one you're talking about? that just Alaska. started selling. There you go. Yeah. Point. We got points on the board, Vince. All right. Ooh, now, Jim, <laughs> where are you going with this? Another state question. So let's see how this goes. What U.S. state is now contemplating raising its fees for businesses operating in its very limited medical marijuana program from $6,000 a business to $1.3 million per business? I don't like to think too much, so I'm just going to go with what pops in my head, and I'm going to say New York is what I think I've heard that with. Good guess, but no. Okay. Sabo for the steal. So can you read yeah. the question one more <laughs> so, time? <laughs> this is a bit com uh, complicated. Maybe I should take So what time. U.S. state is contemplating raising its fee for businesses operating in its very limited medical marijuana program hmm. from $6,000 per business to $1.3 million a business, which is a massive, massive increase that they're contemplating. That sounds like a New Jersey thing. <laughs> it does kind of sound like a New Jersey thing, but no, the state is Texas. Ouch. So they have a very limited uh, CBD only program down there. and. Wow, they're making quite a barrier to entry. I'd have a hard enough time raising $6,000, let alone $1.3 million. It's quite a jump. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah, I thought that was uh, really newsworthy. We wrote about that this week. Um, and Sabo, last question. And you guys are both at a very big disadvantage, but at least it's an equal disadvantage because neither of you live here. But this is interesting, and we'll get some good guesses. I need this one to tie it. <laughs> Denver Mayor Michael Hancock just merged his Office of Marijuana Policy into what existing city department? And it's a fairly common department that would usually exist on any big city or state. And I'll give you guys both a hint. It starts with Department of. <laughs> <laughs> Department of Agriculture. Agriculture, good guess, but no. Jim for the steal and the tie. Department of Revenue? Oh, close. Excise and licenses. Oh, you got to give me that. Come on. Oh. That was super close. <laughs> what do you say, Vince? Don't, he's a Part giant bodybuilder who owns many gyms and all these things. Let's just give it to him. <laughs> and it's I'll a tie. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> you guys, this was fun. I so appreciate it. Pleasure uh, thank meeting you, so you much. actually, finally. Uh, thank you, man. Great hanging out. Um, thanks to my guests, Jim McAlpine and Sabo Shen. Uh, but most importantly, thanks to you guys for watching, listening, and uh, you know, just telling your friends about us. I'm Ricardo Baca, joined by producers Vince and Don. Have a great day, everyone. We will see you next week. I'm allowed to lose. I choose to win. I'm all in. I'm calling any pot. So you'll be raising at the end. I'll say it again. Ain't afraid to get in. I'll be going for the jackpot with Ace in my hand. I'm raw.